Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, everyone, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, you can support us at patreon.com slash oxum or oxum.substack.com or directly on YouTube in many facets. Thank you to all of those of you who do that. Today, we have a returned guest of sorts, and I've been on his program as well, Dr. Michael Winger. Welcome back to the program. Thank you much. It's good to be back. It's been a while. It has been. A lot has happened, uh, I think, in, in your life and especially in your content creation since the last time uh, we exchanged thoughts on this program, although in the interim we exchanged thoughts on on your program. And uh, I don't have the, the highest viewed video on your channel, uh, but I do have the highest viewed of your conversations. So when you're, your, your monologues uh, beat me out, so I, I take that pride. Well, <clears throat> you know... I don't know. I think there's a lot of um, professor level material that I, I've made in a, a popular way to access everybody, um, you know, kind of more academic stuff. But, um, you know, for the general crowds, you, on the other hand, you dominate the podcast by double, at least, if not um, way more than double. And I think after we get, um, you know, some views on philosophy of art and science, people are going to come back and they're going to go, oh, I want to see the Museon episode with Hanok. I, I hope I hope so. Yeah, you did uh, so far for those people who want to look at my channel and search your name once everything is up and I could probably link to it all as well in the description once this video is up. The first thing was you spoke to my Bible study students during the pandemic over Google Meet and then that was very scripture heavy. Um, but we got to talk about a little bit of the Syriac fathers and then we had you as a guest on our show just in general. And then I was a, a guest on on your show and probably going to have many more collaborations down the line. But just to start people off, you've launched a show now since the last time you were on here. So you mentioned it already, but can you mention the name of the show and what it means along with to make it somewhat uh, standalone, just a kind of brief introduction to who you are. I get some complainers sometime about introing guests and I'm like, go watch the old episodes, but a mini intro to yourself, the name of your show and what it means. <laughs> well, I'm right there with you when it comes to intros. Um, I like going, you know, halfway into the conversation when I start the podcast. Like, I always thought it would be cool or maybe more realistic, you know, when whenever you're listening to a podcast, you're basically listening in on a, someone else's conversation, right? Yes. And when we do that in real life, we go ahead and like we mosey on up to somebody or someone's around us and you know maybe they're your friends maybe they're you know you're at a, a party or you're at some um some other type of event and it's like wow that's a cool conversation but you probably don't go there at the start you probably go at midstream and um i think you know there's there's momentum right it's like you know, you're not turning the water on, you're not turning the river on, right? The river's already flowing and then you want to catch a ride. So um, I'm right there it's with not, you on that. It's less, it's less stilted. It's like this, uh, if we want to get nerdy in languages off the jump, like this informal, formal distinction that, that people make. I've heard the linguist uh, John McWhorter talk about this in relation when he was comparing Black English to Standard English, as well as Egyptian dialect Arabic to the modern Standard Arabic. He was talking about the the kind of places that you see the Black English and the Egyptian dialect would be uh, a little bit more formal with the Egyptian dialect. You see it in in films, but you you kind of see the Black English in films as well. But mo mostly informal places, not so much the news, not so much politics, not so much schools, but those kind of informal places where there are a lot of high inferences between people who feel kind of very relaxed that they don't need to put on any show or theater for people to prove their intelligence or you know otherwise competence with the standard yeah i mean it's a it is a different standard too and um i, I like the intimacy of it um as for me you know what is there to say about me i don't know not a whole lot i'm i've got a bio out there somewhere um so maybe i can send it to you you could post it in the description but basically i i like um, the ancient world. I like the Middle East. I like the classical world. Those things are of high interest to me, and they have been for the last 20 years. And um, I have a PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Cultures. I'm uh, the dean of Agora University, which is a um, small and new online university 
that's basically run by the Oriental Orthodox or non-Chalcedonian community. Um, I also teach classes at Fuller Theological Seminary, Antiochian House of Studies, and occasionally, um, well, I used to teach at UCLA. I'd, now I'm working for their digital library on a, a project that has to do with Syriac from the St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai of Egypt. So I'm a nerd. Um, I like Semitics. Um, you and I connected through the nerdiness. And, um, you know, when it's not programmed conversation, like that's where you and I fly, I think. We, we can just let it go. Half the time we talk on the phone, we're upset that we haven't hit record yet. So <laughs> here we are. Um, the lost files. Exactly right. Like behind the paywall, um, <laughs> you know, maybe that. There you go. That's what we're going to start doing. We're going to record the normal conversations, you know, and um, maybe someone has a, a tap on our phone, and that'll be the paywall. But uh, apart from that, yeah, you uh, you're a trailblazer when it comes to podcasting and whatnot. And so um, I followed your lead, and I started a podcast that I had intended to do for a long time, and finally um, got it activated. It's called the Museon. Um, it sounds like museum, and in fact, it's the same etymology, except I'm using the Greek word museon and not the Latin word museum because, well, we we use museum in English. We don't use museon um, in any sort of conversation. And really, it, it's a place of the muses, right? It's a place of inspiration. It's a place of, um, you know, uh, I mean, in a way, it's a philosophy of art and science, but it's, you know... Uh, maybe a little different slant. And, and so I, I, I thought it would be good um, to kind of bridge all my research interests and, you know, whether they're direct research or indirect. And in fact, on my podcast, I try not to, um, I try not to make it too much like I'm lecturing or, um, you know, giving my, my expertise. I want to learn from people right? Like I want to, I'd rather be who I am, but learning rather than who I am and always dishing out information. I think there's, you know, sometimes people get titles and um, it, it, it sort of defines them. And in a way, like, um, you know, who is a, who is the teacher? There's one teacher, right? And um, I, mean, I am a student and I have to, like, I want to be grounded in that. And I learn a lot from you. Um, you know, whether it's private conversation or, you know, watching your podcast and um, vice versa. And there's just so many interesting people out there. So if you wonder how it's spelled, it looks like mouse and ion. And in fact, that's the original logo. Uh, it was a mouse with a, a chemical or a, an, an elemental, excuse me, an elemental ion mark in the corner. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I couldn't get it done in time. So I used the classical like hand of Saruman. Um, you know, which is uh, an interesting image in of itself. It's this, uh, the palm of Mary or the palm of Ishtar. In fact, different cultures have different ways of remembering this hand um, as a protective hand. And it has the eye of the divine eye in the center. In fact, it parallels an image you um, might often see in Orthodox churches of um, the, well, the Greeks would say the, um, they call her the Panaria and the Pantocrator, right? Where Mary is out and, and with her hands and Christ is in the center. And so this idea of the protectiveness of the hand and the d divinity of the eye. And <clears throat> that is not in and of itself a Christian symbol. And in fact, people probably use it more culturally or magically today. Um, but I was going to those... ask you that. Is it is it representative of the ward of the evil eye amulets? Yeah, it's to root out evil. It's to protect. It's kind of like an early gargoyle. It's to root out evil. And if you're scared of it, it means it's scaring the devil inside you. So back <laughs> up, right? Um, but as a as a thought, you know, I thought it, number one, it's cool because it binds the different regions and periods that I'm that I really love um, spending time with, um, from Italy, you know, and the, like my own family tradition. We know about the Malocchio, the the evil eye, right? You know, and this is something in the Middle East, right? And there's a lot um, just on that 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 concept there. But for me, it's a logo. Like it's not, you know, <laughs> it's a logo. It's it's a branding thing, you know. And um, I was telling uh, a friend of mine who, and actually, it's coming up in a, a yet to be released podcast that uh, I, I kind of wanted to take some of the imagery from um, Attitude Era WWF, little NWO, oh, little Gangrel. 
you know, and um, I was going to use that intro music originally, but, I, you know, like I can't gank any music that's not mine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I had to sample some, um, you know, public domain stuff. Uh, but that's that's it out there. The museum's got a whole bunch of interesting uh, conversations, at least to me, they're interesting. I think some people will be bored out of their minds by a few of them. Uh, because they're, <laughs> they're like highly specialized. Like I have one on the science of cheese, mm -hmm. you know, and and um, it's going to take a special person to to dive into that. But who who doesn't want to dive into cheese, right? Yeah, I remember in the film, Thank You for Smoking, if you ever watched it, there was this great scene. I'm forgetting the name of the actor, but he's one of these great actors that everyone would, you know, probably recognize immediately. And he's representing uh, Wisconsin, and he says the great state of Wisconsin will not apologize for its cheese. When the uh, the main kind of lobbyist is kind of seeing uh, connections between diabetes and other diseases with like <laughs> cheese uh, consumption in you know fast food and so many other things versus uh, cigarettes leading to lung cancer, and um, yeah, it. it, it I am always guided by people who are passionate about anything. I always tell people like the criteria for my podcast, you know, being a guest, people think, you know, they see a PhD like you and they're like, oh, I'm not worthy. Uh, no one's going to say Axios to me entering uh, <laughs> philosophy or art and Definitely science. Definitely not me. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I just like people who are passionate and I, I let my curiosity guide me. So I, I appreciate that you too. And I, and I, I, you know, it's hard to not try to bow to the whims of the algorithms to try to get our, our views up as we have burgeoning shows. But yeah, I think you're going to be successful in terms of you stay consistent and you follow your curiosity. I, I know that I find a lot of your videos interesting. You, you have different styles. Like you said, you have some where you... Uh, you know, you're not so modest that you toss away your, your, I mean, you, you teach, you're a teacher at the university level. So you have these, these videos and they get really high views that you said, where you're, you're kind of democratizing or popularizing the knowledge that would normally be reserved for the, you know, hallowed halls, uh, halls of academe. And you're, you know, you're relating Aramaic in the wild, you know, Aramaic in the new Testament, Aramaic, uh, in this random video and you know you're going to do reaction videos to that and you're also having guests on can can you talk about some of the popular uh videos that you've had obviously you know your conversation with me which people of this channel should go check out but what other kind of uh conversations i think what you've had about 20 conversations or so so far what other 26 26 very good so what what are some of the the popular conversations that have been had so far besides cheese and uh <laughs> well cheese isn't that's probably one of my lower ones um it's a long one and but it's like you know i almost want to find some chemistry teachers and like have them like hey you need your students to listen to this and pick <laughs> out the key words show that you understand what's happening right like this is a uh, the guy I talked to is a a food scientist, you know, and he and I talked about beer one time and we talked about cheese another time. And uh, <laughs> like those are, you know, for me, that stuff is cool. You know, um, I've tried brewing beer and I'm um, OK, you know, whatever. <laughs> not that not a master brewer or anything. Um, and I don't really drink. So it's it's more of a, you know, learning crafts and things like that. Why not yeah. learn to make cheese? We make homemade cheese. Um, what do they call it? Farmer's cheese or something like that. But, uh, you know, it's good. It's simple, you know, it's light, um, things like, anyway, I, I'll skip that. Cause you know, I'll, I'll leave that for the people who are into stuff like that. Um, my more successful ones apart from yours are <clears throat> my conversation with, um, father Andreas Andropoulos, who is a colleague of mine at Agora university. He is a, a longtime uh, professor of church history and Eastern Christianity. Um, and we had a conversation about one of his books. Um, he, he, his research, I mean, obviously he's a, he's a tenured professor at the University of Winchester in the United Kingdom. So he's, he's been in the field a long time. And one of his books is called Gazing on God. And it's a, it's a book about art. It's a book about iconography. And then maybe I should say, is it art, right? Like it's, um, our icons art and I recently gave a talk in Dallas on this on this topic and 
uh, I, I tried to be emphatic and say that icons are not art. You know, mm -hmm. and what I mean by that is I don't want you to think that icons are art because I don't want you to reduce icons to art. Sure, they're artistic, and there's a lot of artistic forms used in, in Eastern Christianity to maintain thought. Um, but he and I had a, a fantastic conversation about his book because it's a, um, a brilliant dive, you know, into uh, what makes an icon. And it's not, it, it's not um, like he, he goes over maybe five or six different examples in the text, but really it's about the theology of Eastern Christianity and how icons, um, how they manifest that theology. And uh, it, it's just a cool topic. So uh, that's another highly viewed, highly, you know, they're still half the size of yours. So no, not, no, 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 you're, you're in progress. On, on, that, on that topic, if we can pause there, I know, you know, the, the Greek Orthodox communion, as I refer to them by their languages, uh, just because it makes more sense to me, than, uh, you know, the Chalcedonian, non-Chalcedonian, and Miaphysite, Diaphysite, all these technical terms that are harder for people to regularly identify until they get in the weeds of it. The, the Greeks, let's say, had kind of formal councils and issues around iconoclasm. I kind of always appreciate the Semitic Christianity found amongst the Syriac, which, you know, you're a member of, and that uh, the Ethiopians, which I'm a member of, and one of the things that I, I see there is that we never really had that that issue. Um, is this professor that you're talking about, he's he's in the Coptic tradition? No, he's a he's a um, in addition to being a professor, he's a Greek Orthodox priest. He's a Greek Orthodox. Okay. So so the their iconoclasm was um, more more prevalent, you know. So in terms of like the the formal um, writing against people who are against icons. I'm, I'm wondering from the Syriac tradition, were there ever any arguments like that, especially with like, uh, you know, some people point to the rise of Islam as having some sort of uh, undue influence upon uh, the, the Christians that were, you know, the subjects of the various Muslim rulers. Did that have any impact in terms of iconography in, in the Syriac tradition, as far as you know? It's a good question. I don't know that I can answer that um, as it pertains to the, the period of iconoclasm after Islam, which mm -hmm. is iconoclastic. Um, the conversations I'm aware of in the Syriac tradition typically predate that. Oh, and wow. They're about the types of colors, you know, that should be on certain icons and, um, you know, not necessarily anti or an iconic. Mm -hmm. um, with that said, it, so it's possible that they're out there that I haven't encountered, you know, the earlier, the better is kind of my, <laughs> uh, realm or, you Agreed. know, um, you know, I, I do more Akkadian than things in the middle ages. Right. Mm -hmm. But occasionally I'll read chronographers or, or people from the middle ages just to get perspective on how they interpret the earlier world. Um, so I can't answer that entirely but in the syriac tradition <clears throat> we're certainly minimalists we, that's what um, i thought yeah yeah and that um you know we'll have a curtain um and no iconostasis um now sure we've purchased some churches that come with these things with an iconostasis mm -hmm. but it's not historically um you know what we find in our church um yeah, we, yeah. Okay, go ahead. um yeah you go ahead no, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, it's almost like this reaction that you see that because people were so gung-ho to try to eradicate it amongst the Greeks, you see this almost overemphasis of it. Yeah. But if in the Syriac tradition, there wasn't as much of a serious opposition, like nobody really had that argument, just like nobody really argues about real presence, you know, until the Protestants, um, you know, you just don't even think about it. You know, nobody's arguing about the intercession of the saints. These sort of like fundamental things we just believe, the perpetual, you know, right. virginity of Mary. So many things, it's just like, we're not arguing about those things. Like we're singing praises in poetic ways, <laughs> devotional theology. Like that's what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, so, I, so I'm wondering if that minimalism stems from never having had to battle it out. Well, it definitely wasn't the kind of battle that you saw in Byzantium you know, with the imperial church. And so um, 
we would have icons. You would typically see, if they are in churches, it seems that um, we were more fresco based, right? So instead of a, an icon panel that's put up or pinned on a wall, um, we have the wall itself painted. Mm -hmm. And um, we will find those in some monasteries and some churches in Syria, um, in even uh, the Assyrian monastery and where the Deir Assyrian, as it's called, uh, St. Mary's Monastery in Egypt. <coughs> um, in Turkey, something interesting, you find a lot of curtain iconography, almost like tapestry art. <laughs> and that is iconographic, um, but most of our icon tradition is in the manuscripts, which is also mm -hmm. prevalent in Ethiopia and, and places like that. So yes. the reality is the, the Syriac church in the Middle East was poor and it didn't have the patronage or sponsorship of the empire. Um, so I don't know that the village churches would have um, or afford, you know, this tradition, I'll call it that. Um, and what I mean by afford, I don't mean they're paying people a lot of money, but you, you have to, you know, at least in the early days, you're training people to do this work devotionally. And typically those are monks. And um, <clears throat> this church was, well, um, I don't want to say it was on the run. That's true at different points in history, but it existed sort of under the radar in a lot of cases because the Persian Empire was on one side, the Byzantine on the other, um, and the iconographic tradition is minimalist, um, you know, in the midst of all of that. And to be sure, um, in the Persian Empire, we have the Church of the East, which these days doesn't really have any icon, uh, icon tradition. <clears throat> so some people would say that it's um some people would say icons aren't their tradition if they're from the church of these but that's not true historically it might be the present status um but you have you know a tradition um you know people like abraham of um Nuthbar who you know would talk about uh placing the the virgin and christ uh, icon at the top of the altar right we and do that in our tradition as well in the exactly tradition. right it evokes imagery of the incarnation and the incarnation mm -hmm. the presence of god with us right and so this is the this is a liturgical signal right it's um, a way that the icon participates in the act of liturgy in eastern christianity so <clears throat> it's minimalistic yes uh, but not an iconic even if it doesn't have icons yeah, that's very fascinating. When you were speaking about manuscripts, I thought of uh, this gentleman on Twitter, Dr. James Walters. He's with uh, affiliated with HMML, I believe uh, associated with St. John's University, if I'm not mistaken, where Dr. Getacho Haile of Blessed Memory had a whole lot of his work, and he's always posting these pictures of birds in Syriac manuscripts. There's always like birds being drawn in the kind of uh, corners and edges, and I always find those fascinating and and yeah it's it's a it's a very interesting balance that is is struck there i i know that you've also had several episodes kind of similar to the uh, reverend dr andreas's uh, level with subdeacon daniel who's a uh, kakish who's made the rounds i think he's my, one of the chief podcast guests uh, of, of all time he's he's up there in the orthodox world especially within our communion he's been on my show uh, through your introduction, and he's uh, I've seen him on uh, Reason and Theology, which I've been on as well, the, the kind of Catholic program um, of Michael Lofton, and I, I've seen him a bunch of places. You've done a few episodes with him. How, is, how has been the, the feedback, and what are the topics you've done with, uh, with Subdeacon Dan? Well, it, he needs to plug his own YouTube page. By the way, my podcast and um, <clears throat> my podcast is on Spotify, Apple, and YouTube and a bunch of other smaller venues. The visual, the video is on YouTube and Spotify. Um, everything else is just audio. So there's that I forgot to mention. Beautiful. As for him, he made his own page. Um, but the problem is just like you said, he is this like master guest, you know, <laughs> who appears on, on everyone else's podcast. And uh, I think I have him on my podcast more than he has uh, episodes of his own YouTube page. Uh, so if you're listening, Shamosho Deacon, uh, <laughs> jump on it. You know, we want to see more of you, definitely. 
uh, with him, he's actually second under you. He he and uh, Father Andreas are they're racing, you know, for number two slot because um, you've lapped everybody, right? You're a full lap ahead uh, <laughs> in terms of you know views. Uh, but you know, one thing people may not realize about Subdeacon Daniel, he's not just a guy who goes on, um, you know, a as a guest representing typically Oriental Orthodox Christianity. That's what he does, ninety nine percent or more. Of the time, um, he also he has a, a master's degree in history, and he's completing a second master's degree in Eastern Christian theology, or Eastern Christian studies, and so he's um, he's an academic. He's very well trained. Um, he's a researcher, and he's quite knowledgeable in a number of areas. And um, I try and um, you know I don't want to reinvent the wheel and just do like theological conversation. That's easy, you know, like. <laughs> um, and my page isn't, it's not a theology page. I'm happy to talk theology. I love it. It's interesting. But like, there's other things to talk about. And with Subdeacon Daniel, um, you know, he was on my third episode. Technically, it's like my my second with a guest. My first episode was a solo, and it's only available in audio format. Um, but my, my third episode, he came on to discuss mapping the Middle East because, um, you know, in the West, and I assume that most of your listeners are either in the West or in Ethiopia or some spot like that, in the West, we don't have a, a strong understanding of that region, of that part of the world. And um, it's quite detrimental to uh, the people who live there. Um, I know yes. I have been informed by, you know, different, um, well, I don't know how I should say these things. Um, <laughs> but there are, there are people in the State Department who go over to the Middle East and, and know nothing. You know, basically, that's not always the case, but um, it's a problem. And so, something as simple as talking about, well, why are these lines there? Why is Iraq the way it's shaped? Why does Jordan look like a teapot or a, an air horn or something, right? Like, <clears throat> um, why does, you know, Syria look the way it, it slice a pizza or I don't know, you know, why does it look the way it, it does? And, and, um, why Turkey in its shape? Uh, mm -hmm. All these things are interesting questions that really come to us in the 20th century. Yeah. And so, you know, basically I pick his brain about that topic. Um, also, um, I did an episode with him on an introduction to the Arabs and the same sort of thing. People will think, oh, they're all Arabs over there. And I that's a, <clears throat> that's a reduction, um, number one, because people don't, not everyone speaks Arabic there. Um, a lot of people grow up speaking Aramaic or Kurdish or, you know, different dialects of Turkish or whatever. And so um, that calling people Arabs who may be Arab speakers <clears throat> is in a way, I don't want to call it an injustice, even though some may, may agree with that. I think it's just a, it's unfair because there's a culture of um, real Arabs. And when I say real like I'm not trying to put anybody down, but like there are people who are Arabized in the same way you and I are Anglicized. Mm -hmm. We're having this conversation in English, you know. Um, maybe, you know, out of the two of us, I probably have English. Her I do have English heritage, right? Yeah, and I know I don't. <laughs> well, you know, let's see, let's see. You know, um, maybe maybe we have Ethiopian heritage in in Western Europe. Most of my my lineage is from uh, Western Europe or the Mediterranean world, like Italy and Greece. But um, it's mostly, uh, I don't know, not, yeah, it's mostly Northern Europe. Um, anyway, all that to say, we're speaking English. Are we Englishmen? Um, we're not necessarily Englishmen. We're both um, citizens of the United States. We have our own history and background. And I know you and I are, you know, the type of people who preserve um tradition and we enjoy it and celebrate it and share it you know and um we learn from one another because of it and so um it's the same with the arabs there's real Ar like arab culture from the peninsula mm -hmm. and then there's people who adopted arabic due to you know um due to conquest of different places i mean look at north africa it's basically arabic speaking you know yeah. for the most part um <clears throat> same with the near east or you know, people call it the Middle East. Now people like to call it um, 
Can you talk about the difference between that? Because I just briefly, while we're discussing that, right? So you talk about like the Gulf, the peninsula, you know, yeah. like Oman, Qatar, UAE, Saudi, uh -huh. you know, Yemen to some extent, even though they're different, you know, South, they, I've seen people start posting, they have signs in South Semitic script now, like in Yemen, which is kind of cool. Oh, for real? That's awesome. Yeah, a side by side with the Arabic script. And that's, that's very interesting. But like, people use these terms Middle East, Near East, and then I see a lot of uh, Lebanese, you know, led by Nassim Taleb, uh, you know, who lean on Eastern Mediterranean rather than either of those two. Yeah, it's a, it's, um, I don't know. I think we go through periods where we try, let's still call it this. There's the, um, there's the honest approach that seeks to better, um, use better or more precise terminology out of respect for mm -hmm. different people um, and places and histories that has seen like the word middle east for example was more like um afghanistan central asia you know mm -hmm. kind of moving toward india now what we call india south asia yeah right so asia is a you know like that's a problematic term right now that's it, like people will um, instead of saying middle east because Historically, the Near East is what today we call the Middle East, right? Mm -hmm. But people didn't want to say that because it's Eurocentric. Um, my argument is, yeah, but we're speaking English, you know, and so that's that's the framework from, you know, when the the terminology comes. An alternative these days is Southwest Asia, North Africa, Swana, or Mina, Middle East, North Africa. Yeah, I've um, seen this. You know, it, <clears throat> look, people are trying to do that because they. I'm assuming the best, right? Like, because they want to be respectful and they want to be more accurate and precise. And maybe they'll look to older terms and associate it with colonialism. <clears throat> In a way, it's all, it's all the same reality because the term Asia is the coast of, the west coast of Turkey, okay? So the west coast of Turkey is Asia. You, in, if that's the case, we have no right to refer to what historically was called the Orient, right? Like China, Korea, Japan, places like this, as Asia, right? That is a Eurocentric view of that continent or supercontinent, right? Um, the terms Occident and Orient, <clears throat> you know, they they have different um, fans and haters. You know, a lot of people today don't like the term Orient. Um, mostly because of colonial connection, uh, but in academia, like there's a um, there's a society called the American Oriental Society, and it's really the only place where you can bring studies of um, the Middle East or the Near East, the ancient Near East, um, the Arabic speaking or the Islamic world, uh, places like India and the subcontinent Southeast Asia, and then China, uh, China, Japan, the Far East. Um, and so, you know, it's used in that sense and it hasn't gone away because it's a meeting place for all those things. Uh, but, you know, different people have different feelings about these terms. And for us, you know, if, if I'm speaking Aramaic, I don't call it the Middle East. I call it Beth Nahrin. You know, I don't call it, um, you know. And what does that mean, Beth Nahrin? Say again. What does it mean? The house of what? Uh, yeah, between two rivers between two rivers yeah between the two rivers or you know you could say the place or the location of the two rivers mm -hmm. and it's a dual meaning the two rivers the tigris and euphrates mm -hmm. um you know we don't call it the misa'at madenher we don't call it the middle east like that's a that would be a translation right or a yeah. calc from one language to another it has its own name in the same way that germans don't say ja wir from germany okay they do if they're speaking english but they don't say you know um they're from the fatherland, right? Yeah. Yeah. Ich bin von uh, Germany. They say, ich bin von Deutschland, right? They say Deutschland. They have their own way to describe themselves in their language. So, I don't know. I, I think people, like, I don't care. Uh, yeah. I'm more of the, like, well, what was it historically and why? And, um, you know, I, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. <laughs> but at the same time, like, um when i use a certain language i will use the terms of that language and um, when i use a different you know language i'll 
um, I'll use whatever the flex is, you know, in my field. And so mm -hmm. different people like in my journal is in my journal, my degree is in near Eastern languages and cultures, right? It's not in um, Middle East, North African, you know, or Southwest Asia, <coughs> North African languages and cultures. Yeah, I like I like the precision. And I know that people are liking and trying to identify at a more tribal or localized level, however it is to be described. But for the most of the history of, of this area, and you can say it much better than I, there were series of empires um, that were in this area. <laughs> I happen to have students this year teaching middle school again, uh, especially sixth grade ancient history, where they go through the Akkadians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Egyptians, you know, the people before, uh, during the Bronze Age, after the Bronze Age, there were so many different empires up until, as you said, you know, the Ottomans were shrunk after the World Wars. And that that changed a lot of the area that uh, wasn't until just a couple of years ago that I realized that the Ottomans even had a couple of ports in modern day. Eritrea, which you know would have been in the the greater Horn of Africa, the kind of purview of Ethiopia, and it's kind of crazy for me to think about because you know I always hear about you know the Turks having some involvements since like the 1500s in backing different groups trying to destroy Ethiopia, but uh, you know thinking of an active influence up into like the time that they started retreating in the 1800s and you know ultimately in the early 1900s had to contract even further it, it is very interesting how these these places change and like you said there's like a larger identity and for me there's precision is the number one goal but you know if, if you don't understand each other there's no point to your precision so using terms that you understand and using these terms as conversation starters not as the end of a, a conversation so that's that's good. You were able to speak about your big point was that you were able to speak about not just theology, where you have a subdeacon and uh, a teacher <laughs> uh, at a religious institution of some sort affiliated with two patriarchs of Antioch and of Alexandria, right? Uh, we didn't even mention, right, that we're the Oriental Orthodox Church. So there's that word Orient again there, which is why I always opt for, you know, Afro-Asiatic going for the languages because Orient is crazy it's even crazier when you try to distinguish orient from east <laughs> and you're just you know using different um etymologies for the same meaning like switching yeah. up freedom and liberty or ethics and, and uh, morals right right are there are there any other uh, popular episodes that you've had you know relatively that you think people should go check out i mean f f like obviously the idea of uh, sex robots in, in one of them and then the conversations you've had with your father, I think it's incredible. I've, I've asked both of my parents and both of my parents have declined. So as as much podcast success as you think I've had, I failed to get my own parents. So I'm I'm jealous that you got to have your own father on your show. Yeah, um, you know, I try and be diverse and I like to get, um, you know, a wild range like, you know, cheese, <coughs> cheese and sex robots, <laughs> you know, like what could be better? Um, <laughs> and theology and icons, right? Like, uh, so just briefly on the uh, on the artificial intelligence one, and you know, there's a little clickbaitiness with the sex robot thing, but <clears throat> part of that is, you know, we it looks like that if there are any humanoids or artificial intelligent like dro androids that develop that are, um, you know, the cultivated and act maybe activated. Um, in the future when the technology suffices, it's probably going to go th through this route, through the route of, um, you know, humans utilizing people for their, their when humans utilizing <clears throat> these, um, now they're dolls, right? And um, they went from being blow up dolls to, you know, these mannequin type, you know, things and now the way they're building them they respond to you they um can respond to tone they you know have um this animatronic these animatronic relaxation reactions that make you think they're actually listening to you and so they're machines 
But if we look at the trajectory and the development of artificial intelligence, um, it's an interesting idea. And I, I talked to um, a, a fellow scholar who just put out a book on um, Battlestar Galactica and religion <clears throat> and just the, the religion of this book. And so um, she does a lot of um, interesting research in sci-fi. <clears throat> People may enjoy it. It's not like, you know, stand by one second. Yeah. I had a big cough. I, I had to get out. Um, so, you know, it's don't let the title fool you. It's not like pornographic or anything. It's just a question of um, how do we get to, you know, this phase where we basically create a, a new life form. And, um, you know, it's kind of where sci-fi meets science future. And uh, I think it's a cool episode. I'm going to have her on um, just to talk about her book, um, have her on again. And then, you know, like you said, my dad. Um, you know, my dad is a very intelligent person. He's a very well-read person. He has um, amazing life experiences that I haven't even begun to to record yet. Um, really, we read books together for the most part. And um, yeah, it's kind of like, what can we talk about? You know, and, um, you know, he has this group of guys that he goes and hangs out with in the mornings for coffee and stuff. And they talk about things like this. And sometimes I'll go and um, when I'm in the area and you know, if you're reading the, the same material, you talk about the same material. Yeah. So we worked on it. He was my first uh, podcast, actually. And um, it was a book we had just read. It was like, <clears throat> let's podcast on it. And um, it's a, a sports psychology book called It Takes What It Takes. Um, we've done other books like The Peter Principle, which is one of the most important books in the modern era, I think. And we've also done one, um, Born Fighting, how the Scots-Irish, you know, um, uh, what did they do? They came to America. What's the subtitle? Um, uh, how the Scots Irish shaped America, right? And it's about you know people who were basically lowlander Scots who went to England, or no, I'm sorry, they went to Northern Ireland, and from there, you know, after about a hundred years, they migrated to the United States or what would become the United States, the colonies, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, they form a major backbone of the cultural strand in the in the US but their rugged individualism and like their they the book is basically charting how they um inherit this celtic tribal tradition that manifests itself over time to, in different ways depending on the conditions surrounding it and a large part of what motivated the independence movement was not just the english settlers who tended to be more coastal, um, you know, in the the early colonies, but these these hardcore or hard, you know, Celtic people, who, um, you know, the Lowlander Scots, for example, they're not the Highlanders, right? Like the Lowlanders are William Wallace, Braveheart, you know, Robert the Bruce. They're the guys on the border with England who are mm -hmm. always scrapping and fighting, and they're like fighting for their life the whole time. When the Romans were there, the Romans built a wall to keep them out, right? So <laughs> um, Hadrian's Wall, and so. It's a cool book. It's got some pretty good views. Um, and then we also talk genealogy because uh, my dad's a genealogist and um, we're pretty deep in family history. You know, I can go back a thousand years on, on one side of my family and several hundred on the other. And um, yeah, it's uh, they're cool conversations and many more will come. Um, if nothing else, you know, like I think people will. I think people will like him, uh, but at the same time, you know, it's me talking to an older guy, and uh, he gets to learn more about us in our sort of dynamic just through those conversations. No, those are so helpful. There's a uh, uh, a filmmaker, Haile Garima, and he had he is one of my influences for making a podcast. And one of the things he told me early on, this was like over ten years ago when we were meeting up, was about just using whatever you have, you know, it could be a notepad, it could be audio alone, and it could be video and to just record, especially older people, because you don't know what you're going to, the gems you're going to miss out on. And I remember when I was living in North Dakota, I was freaking out about the longtime abbot of this liturgical school, who was also the the man who baptized me and spent 30 years as head of uh, head abbot uh, at a liturgical school in Ethiopia, and then 30 years at my home parish where he baptized me and then I got to serve with him as a deacon. And I had just moved to North Dakota and I was like, man, I need to get some recording of this guy. You know, he was, he was up there. He was in his late eighties and I, I just got a friend to do it. 
And the friend first did like a six, eight minute audio recording as a sample. And he said he was going to do like a full, you know, 30 minutes to an hour. He never did the 30 minutes to an hour. And he, uh, you know, the priest fell asleep with the Lord, the Hiro monk, he fell asleep with the Lord. But I took that six, eight minutes. It was in Amharic. And I kind of gave an intro to it in English. And I released it as a podcast episode of my Tawado Bible study podcast. And a lot of people uh, in the year he passed, uh, two years he passed, five years he passed. Like, I don't think it's been five years, but whatever, three years, four, however many years it's been, they like re-listen to it. And they tell me things that they heard from that one, you know, little piece of effort. So I think it's uh, it's a tremendous effort to be able to look into that. In terms of the Scots Irish, I've I've read a few things about them as well. I've always heard about the Hatfields and the McCoys growing up in the United States about yeah. the the sort of Romeo and Juliet like you know family rivalries that. Mm -hmm. That culture is very, it's the same as the Amhara culture. In Amharic, we call it the Malashnet or um, the returning of blood. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like vengeance, like that vengeance culture, tribal culture. And I, yeah, I see that the, the kind of New England dissenters and separatists, along with the lowland Scots Irish, make a perfect resistance for England. And it's not just like way back in the independence movement. I always hear about the Scots Irish also in terms of the moonshine culture when yeah. prohibition was around. So in that Kentucky, Tennessee, the Appalachia uh, region, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it's a you know one of those things that's easy to gloss over when you study American history, right? And these people groups um, who, you know, we all bring something, right? And I think the earlier people came, the less familiar we are with their culture because it somehow merged into a standard and you know people would call it i don't know they'd call it whatever they want um but it's you know <clears throat> it's racked with its own nuances and um, if you ever get a chance to read the book born fighting it's an it's an interesting book so um it turns genealogical at the end you know I, but i think the thesis is interesting because it's you know and, and we could do it maybe for ethiopia or you know different countries and and look at different people who maybe become minority communities over time and how does their status as a minority um like how how are they represented and how do they continue or how do they keep continuity with their ancient past what we know of them you know what we know of the lowlanders the romans give us right these guys don't get an alphabet and they don't get literacy until much later. Um, and so, you know, you have to kind of um, search through history and see how people talk about them until they can talk about themselves. And um, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, we wish we had podcasts from the time that they didn't have uh, <laughs> writing that we could listen to their podcast and see what it was that they thought. I, I think it would be remiss, though, in, in speaking about writing if I, I didn't ask you about Aramaic and Hebrew, you know, I know you have so many Semitic languages in your repertoire and uh, even Sumerian, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, one of these, I think, independent branches of Indo-European, and you could argue or tell me about what it's related to uh, linguistically, but uh, especially Hebrew and Aramaic as it pertains to scripture, I always found it fascinating. I think there's this one passage in, uh, Acts, uh, I think it's Acts 19, it's somewhere Acts 19 to 21, where Paul is allowed to speak to the people. And I, I remember reading some versions where it would say he began speaking in the Aramaic tongue, and then others where it says he began speaking in the Hebrew tongue, and they began to pay attention more than when he was speaking in what you assume was Greek before. And this idea that when you kind of speak in someone's language, they pay attention more, but also there's this interesting relationship between Aramaic and Hebrew. And I, I wonder if you can uh, stress for us the, the importance of Aramaic and Hebrew for anyone who's interested in the Bible, because not everyone who follows the philosophy of art and science is interested in the Bible, but I'd have to say there's probably a large Venn diagram where the people who are fans of the show are also fans of scripture. Yeah. I mean, um, as far as my training goes, <clears throat> um, 
you know, I've touched Sumerian, but it's not really a Semitic language. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that I would call it Indo-European either. Um, it's difficult to place. It's a language isolate as far as we know, but that's, you know, because we're, we're limited in what we know about it. And um, there's clues for connections with different language families. Um, but Sumerian is important for learning a major, and maybe not, maybe the most major Semitic language, um, and that's Akkadian, because Sumerian gives Akkadian its writing system and a number of uh, very important loan words. Now, Akkadian is the language spoken by the historical Babylonian and Assyrian people. Um, think of ancient Iraq for the most part. But Akkadian became the lingua franca of the entire region, um, extending as far as Egypt. You know, so, you know, we found a lot of um, Akkadian doc documents at Tel El Amarna. We call them the Amarna tablets. And um, those are the know, letters, right, that are exchanged during the Bronze Age between the various yeah. rulers. Yeah, right. And um, we learn about Jerusalem because people, you know, the Abdi Kheba is writing to, um, you know, the Pharaoh, you know, complaining, you know, all, all these whiny little letters, you know, I've sometimes I've heard referred to. Uh, so Akkadian is a, it's one of my favorite languages. You know, we could do a podcast just on language stuff one time. Yeah. Um, and we should. Uh, but, you know, w when I say one of my favorites, because I've studied a lot, it doesn't mean I speak a lot. People think, oh, you study so many, you know so many. Well, I studied a lot that doesn't mean that I know a lot, right? Like, you know, I can speak in a few, you know, um, several maybe, but I've studied a lot. And so I use them for research or like who speaks Akkadian? No one speaks Akkadian, right? So um, it's a research language. Um, it's fossilized uh, quite literally actually because the documents we have are tablets, you know, they're clay tablets. They're also monumental inscriptions and little um boule and things like this but they um they're preserved as tablets so sometimes if you think about the bible when you think you know what what was moses writing you know on were they wax tablets or were they akkadian clay tablets and we could even call um hebrew at that time peripheral akkadian uh, because there are there's a Canaan, canaanite dialect of akkadian that was found in the west and so Moses, um, you know, that tradition may be reflecting, you know, something that um, would have been, I don't know, relayed in Akkadian or something like that. Um, now, you ask about Aramaic and Hebrew. Um, other important Semitic languages are like Ge'ez, Ethiopic, of course, Arabic, the most widely spoken Semitic language, Phoenician. Um, Ugaritic, things like this. So Hebrew and Aramaic are very important for scripture uh, because the world of what we would call the Old Testament, what others would call the Hebrew Bible, um, was crafted in Hebrew and Aramaic together. Um, mostly Hebrew. There's a couple Ezra and, and Daniel and then here and there and some other places um, are in Aramaic. Everything else is in Hebrew. And Hebrew is... Um, you know, being a Semitic language, it doesn't operate the way European or Indo-European, for that matter, languages operate. Um, you could call it poetic. You could call it, you know, it, it's it's not the opposite of Greek philosophy, but it's a different perspective. It, it seeks less precision and more um, connection, right? You know, connecting ideas. Um, it's a great language. I love Hebrew. Um, I mean, I do like Aramaic more, but that's because I'm biased. Um, <laughs> I pray in Aramaic, right? <laughs> it's um, speak it at home, you know. So Aramaic is a very great language. And, you know, Aramaic is um, it's important for Eastern Christianity because unlike the way Christianity moves in the West, <clears throat> where it's a Greco-Roman tradition that's using Greek and Latin um, as its language base, in the East, Aramaic rules. The New Testament is an Aramaic, right? The New Testament's a Semitic document. Um, it's not a Greek one. Even if it is translated from Greek, it's translated with an Aramaic subtext where people are reading the Greek and going, yeah, but this is a guy from our town saying it this way because that's how we try and say it in Greek. And then they say it the Aramaic way in the 
um, Shito and, and other translations. Um, <clears throat> but it it's not just scripture, it's uh, the patristic thought that's encoded in Aramaic. And so people who are students of scripture, uh, they get something out of the study of Aramaic or Hebrew that they would not get otherwise. Maybe it's just like putting a magnifying glass to something you already love, right? It's not radically different, but it's um, it's a flower that has bloomed, right? Like it's not it's not the you describing the flower and understanding you know the theory of how plants grow and that there's a bud and stuff like that. It's you seeing and smelling this bloomed flower. And so, yeah, it's still the same flower. That's fine. But um, it is a um, Addis Ababa. It is a new flower, if I could say it in such a way, right? And so um, a new bloom maybe is the way, right? Abab to, to bloom. Um, so anyhow, uh, the Semitic languages are cool. They're deeply insightful, and uh, they magnify the experience in, in ways that the West ought to know. And one of the things that I kind of focus on in life, um, you know, my life is sort of driven by or it's motivated by um, a couple things. One is I want people to develop an awareness of what kind of world they live in. You know, I want to ask people, all your viewers, let's say, what kind of world do you want to live in, right? Like, you know, whether we talk about the world we, <clears throat> we're in favor or against, maybe we're complaining about something, um, <clears throat> what are we doing to make the world better? And what are we doing to construct the world the way we want, right? Like, I don't think we're aware of that as much. We're more passive. We as just society and not you and me per se, but, um, or your listeners for that matter, but, you know, as a society, we kind of we're viewers, and we should take an active role in constructing the 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 way we want to be. The other is I want people to, uh, as part of that equation, I want to see the Semitic languages grow in the West. I would like for Syriac to be as ubiquitous as Hebrew and Greek. I mean, or study of Scripture. Um, you know, like when it comes to Syriac, Syriac's it's a um, basically a literary dialect of Aramaic from a certain city that it radiated forth. Um, what that just means is certain spellings occur certain ways. And maybe the people who are writing use certain vocabulary terms, kind of like the way the English write one way. You know, they talk about a lift to go to their flat. What the heck are you talking about? A lift to go to your flat? No, he means the elevator to go to his apartment. Both of those are perfectly fine English. But, you know, different people in different regions may prefer different terminology. Uh, Syriac, that's all it is. It's just, um, it's not that different substantially. Um, but things like Syriac and things like Gerez, Ethiopic, are, are theological languages. They're languages that reflect a worldview. And, you know, you can talk about these languages. And we have in the past, whether you're <clears throat> on your podcast or on mine, where you get... Um, a portrait of the world crafted in a way that's different than the languages we typically operate in. So, um, yeah, there's, I mean, a lot I could talk about when it comes to, to languages, Semitic languages. Um, they're just really cool. They're interesting. They look cool. Uh, <laughs> and they function, you know, in a unique way. Right. So, yeah, I obviously agree. <laughs> um, Amharic is the only one that I ever confidently say that I'm a native speaker of and some crazy organization actually rated me and gave me some certificate that gave me this, uh, I think it was level six or something on a scale of like one to six that made me a university native speaker, even though I was born in the US. And so that's a flex uh, to all my aunties and uncles who try to test me in, a <laughs> in my Amharic. And it's not because I'm special, it's because I care about it, and, you know, and they don't as much. So I just put in that that time and and that that effort as well maybe i am special who knows but um you know i oh, you're i'm getting i'm <laughs> i'm getting conversational in, in tigrinya during the pandemic i began reading um biblical hebrew and um you know i i have read texts in english by people like uh you sebastian brock um the metropolitan hilarion 
who have written about the Syriac fathers, like uh, Mar Ephraim, Mar Isaac, uh, Mar Jacob, and, and all of them, uh, Mar Narsai. And through through that kind of osmosis, you know, I I kind of uh, pick up some of the words, and then obviously some of the words like Haimanot are the same, <laughs> straight up, or Kashisho, oh, yeah. <laughs> they're just straight yeah. up the same the same words. Um, I had a couple questions that I wanted to follow up in in this regard. So you speak of the New Testament of having like this subtext of Aramaic where the the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible has straight up long passages, if not uh, entire books in Aramaic. The but there are also you know straight up phrases like purely even in the Greek texts of uh, transliterated Aramaic throughout the the New Testament, which you've covered on your your channel as well. I wanted to uh, hear any thoughts you had about you know when they straight up like not just the subtext, but when they're literally quoting the aramaic like stand up little girl or uh, my god my god why have you forsaken me you know the shout out to the psalm 22 like talk about the straight up quotations in aramaic in the new testament uh, the greek or or syriac but then also a word that's like so common that i think everyone says and you know try to say it as well is like the amen the the agreement the agreement the concurrence, the you know, the veracity that that word, for example, you know, is there anything you know about it being either Hebrew or Aramaic or both, or you know, so old and Semitic that nobody knows? Maybe it's proto-Semitic or something. Yeah, I mean, it's um, probably written different ways in um, different periods. So, like Haimanut, Ethiopian Haimanutho, Syrian or Syriac, <clears throat> meaning faith is like emuna in Hebrew. So the- so We have that too, which is funny. <laughs> okay, well, interesting. I mean, one yeah. might be, um, you know, a, a historical Ethiopic word, and the other might be an import from the, the nine saints or the Syrian fathers who preached in Ethiopia, Abba Frumentius, Abba Salama, you know, people who, um, you know, went back and forth. And there's a lot of back and forth, usually, through the Red Sea and, you know, by the agency of Arabia, where the Syrian fathers come to the Horn of Africa, <coughs> Ethiopia. Um, and so the root we're using is H-Y-M as opposed to A-Y-M, um, or I'm sorry, A-M-N um, and H-M-N. Um, and so it's basically the same, but it may manifest, you know, orthographically different. That means in spelling, the spelling might be different. Um, depending on the tradition. Syrians will also say things like amino eth after eating, you know, and it's like a way of giving thanks or may it be sustainable, you mm -hmm. know, like this food. Um, you can, you yeah, know, what's the alternative? Allah um, Zidli, that's may God multiply it. But um, amino eth is the other one, you, you know, there that's looking for sustainability and it's re related to this idea of being firm. Um, and that's true. So it's a mark of truth, of veracity, you could say. Uh, and so, yeah, it's it's present in both traditions. When it comes yeah. to the New Testament, um, there's a lot of interesting, like words that are preserved in the Greek, and some of these are liturgical cues from the ancient church. So they would use Aramaic cues. The maybe like the ones that survive today are hallelujah right in mm -hmm. some places kuria um which is a you know that's a i don't know why why that became so ubiquitous in the eastern like the syriac and ethiopic you know maybe ethiopic is by way of alexandria um but you know it, they're used frequently and so some of these like uh who is it um ambrose of milan talks about um, the phrase ethbathah, which means be opened. It's a command given in Mark, Mark 7, I think 734. And, um, you know, it talks about like being, um, having your ears opened, ready to receive the gospel. So it could be that these, and they're especially found in the book of Mark. I mean, Matthew uses, um, what does he use? I just did a video on it, Raqqa, you know. Fool, you're brain, right? you're brainless. Yeah. You. Um, I always remember that one. That 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 one always. Twit, you know, like, 
uh, my latest <laughs> video was on that one, so it's a fun one. Um, and you know, Paul will say Maranatha, our Lord is coming. Yeah. And uh, you know, of course, you mentioned Eli Eli Mashwakdeni, which is a quotation of the not just Psalm twenty-two, but the Aramaic Targum of Psalm twenty-two. Mm -hmm. So a Targum is a translation. I'm sure your Targuma, you know, or yeah. Targuam, you know, in, yeah, Targum or Targuami. There you go. So yeah. it's you know it works in both languages, right? The translation. So um, the ancient Jewish community, you know, that had lost functional Hebrew use would have scripture in Aramaic so that people would understand it because that was the language of the people for, um, you know, centuries. And uh, many of those ancient translations are um, quite useful. So yeah, even the culture is the same. Our, our mutual alam or olam uh, has hopefully his uh, you know his work is is on that sub that very subject of the 17th century is to amharic same same thing oh yeah i mean yeah i mean hebrew um the rabbinical exegetical tradition is quite like andantan and these ethiopian traditions of uh, you know scriptural exegesis really cool So yeah, you've you've done a number of videos on these in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark and all over the New Testament. So people definitely need to go check out the Museon so that they themselves can feel the muse. They themselves yeah. can be inspired. I hope we've given them a nice gursha or a nice uh, mouthful so far of um, what you've been able to do. Can you do your final plugs and if you have any outgoing words as well? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm in between seasons right now because it's fall semester and I'm teaching a lot and I'm doing a lot of administrative stuff. <laughs> so um, look for it to start up, hopefully Thanksgiving time um, to restart. I don't know if I want to call it season two or not, but I'm going to do some improvements. I'll have more professional athletes on God willing. And um, you know, I have a, a former Miami Marlins, Cleveland Indians baseball player, um, who who talks about his journey and path and I thought that was a really cool conversation it should get more views but it, it's um it's quite recent so it's still under a hundred and um, that's nothing for YouTube but uh, it's a cool one and so anyway um, you can find me on YouTube um, I'm like you know forward slash um, what is it C slash professor Michael Wingert so <laughs> at YouTube the link will be below um, and then on Spotify and Apple, you can find me at the Museon, Mouse Ion, M O U S E I O N, um, or the Professor Wingert or Professor Michael Wingert podcast. Uh, you can reach out to me there. Uh, occasionally, I do some Q and A videos. Again, I haven't recently because I'm swamped. Uh, but you know, you can send in your questions, leave comments, and um, you know, I have a a nice interface with the audience the same way you do. So. Um, thanks so much for having me, my man. And we're going to have you back on the Museon um, soon, hopefully sooner rather than later. And, um, you know, catch his original episode on Oxum, Los Angeles, when you get a chance. Thank you so much. And if I can put you on the spot, are there any Aramaic uh, prayers on your heart that you could close with because you know i'm sure in your react videos they'll see it but i'm sure some people have okay renderings of the aramaic but some of them are butchering them uh, out there it's true <laughs> but you know what like a for effort and honestly i would rather it spread aramaic even if it's you know kind of like um if i were to do ethiopic and go bisma ab wa, wa world will memphis kiddus Right, like some of it sounds like that, you know, to the ear instead of this ma'abwa wa wuld wa minfis kidus ahadu amalaka mean, which sounds maybe a little more, maybe it's still Ferengi, but it's uh, you know, a little more in line with the pronunciation. Um, so I don't know, I can I can give us one if if that's what you're asking. Please. Moran Yashram Shiha Tar Aud Rahmaik Lotehud Bafain Mur Hata Yehnan Maldinan is Rahama Lain. I wonder which my own is Kadash Shmok, Tite Melkutho, Nekwesa Yonok, I cannot wish me of Parao, Hablan Lahmel Sunkonan Yomono, which will clan Havain Wakahain, I cannot do for Nan Shvahim Lahayove, Lota Alan and Siono, El Pasolom and Bisho, Motos de Dilo Himel Kuto, Hilo, the Spectre, Olam, Almin, Amen.